Good day chaps. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. We're going to take a quick break from the future main battle tank series while I try and source a few more images. So we're going to look at something quite unusual. It's the P-35 ground and air experimental leaping vehicle. For this we need to go back to the 1960s. It was a time of good music, bad fashion and copious amounts of narcotics with this latter element being one of the only plausible reasons that some of the jumping and flying vehicles were devised by the British. Because there is more than one, or two, there are close to eight designs, many of which got quite far in development before stopping, probably around the same time that mandatory drug testing became a thing. The origins of the project began in the late 50s, and although one could sensibly assume it was down to a bad batch of tea, the War Office itself became interested once again in the idea of high mobility vehicles to the Army, able to cross rough terrain or obstacles in unusual ways. They set a general staff target, 3129, to create a vehicle that was primarily land-based with good cross-country performance, but the ability to also cross very rough or soft terrain or bodies of water with an air cushion and to be able to jump over obstacles at least 10 foot high and 30 foot wide. Now this wasn't the first time we'd delved too deep into the medicine cabinet, as during World War II similar efforts had been done by strapping six large Acme rockets onto the side of a universal carrier to jump over minefields, with some fairly predictable results. We also built and tested the rotor buggy in 1943, a sort of jeep-auto-gyro hybrid, which surprisingly worked. It was towed behind a plane to gain lift, but was cancelled when it was decided to simply put the jeep inside of the glider and not outside. Between 1959 and 1961, a number of preliminary and superficial feasibility studies in this field were carried out, with a wide variety of vehicles from different firms, including Hanley Page and English Electric. These firms were overseen by the War Office and the Ministry of Aviation, who had two types of vehicle in mind. One would be a free-flying military vehicle, able to operate as a jet-powered aircraft or helicopter, as well as a military ground vehicle. The other one was a jumping vehicle. It was decided fairly on that the free-flying concept was a no-go. It was going to be prohibitively expensive and could have possible serious disadvantages. They also probably ran a full investigation to see if bears do actually shit in the woods, but I digress. The Air Ministry also noted that the US had recently spent $10 million on a similar idea, the Air Jeep, to no avail, as despite it working it was not actually required. And so the British idea, like the American one, was dropped. Meanwhile the jumping vehicle was deemed more practical, and they felt it showed some promise for future military applications in 1961. In October 1961 the Weapons and Equipment Policy Committee approved the proposal, and that the Ministry of Aviation should place a contract with English Electric Aviation for feasibility studies for a ground and air vehicle designated P-35 at a cost of about £62,000 or about £1.4 million with inflation. Although a few sensible people were already concerned about the price and future costs of such a vehicle, the Defence Research Policy Council endorsed it should go further. These studies by English Electric inspired confidence with those who supported the vehicle and therefore it's decided to build four experimental test beds with the number P35. Note that it has a P number, not an FV number, as the Ministry of Aviation is the parent, not the Army. Although it was also noted that nobody in the Army had actually determined which aspects, if any, might be useful to them or indeed even had any operational requirement for a vehicle like this. However, it's also shiny and new, and the army is irrevocably addicted to shiny, expensive things. And so some felt that it might have uses in reconnaissance, a light weapons carrier, or liaison purposes. Thus, the WEPC approved the system for further work without a single actual established military requirement to which the end project could be applied. It was decided to split the development into three stages, from testing to procurement but the budget itself had expanded, as full development was now going to cost around 1.3 million, or 29.5 million today for the development alone, and a further 30,000 pounds at a time, or 600,000 pounds a day, 
per vehicle, roughly six times the cost of a chieftain at the time. This proposal was endorsed by the DRC and received approval of the General Staff and Secretary of State in July 1964. These however would be done by the BAC in Preston, Lancashire, which had then been formed as a government pressure merger from English Electric Aviation, Vickers Armstrong Aircraft and Bristol Aircraft in 1960. Stage 1 testing, primarily detailed drawings and concept work, was carried out and the Air Ministry was set for Stage 2 in 1965, although they noted that the cost had risen again for each vehicle, now coming to £43,000 at a time, or roughly £978,000 per vehicle, which is quite a pricey sum for something which hasn't actually been asked for. At this time, the Army then felt it was too much and withdrew support from the project. The price jump was actually down to the FVRDE, who had insisted on bigger engines, as well as problems from BAC around a joint Anglo-French project. In 1966, the budget was pulled when the prices began to go up again, as the MGO, or Master General Ordnance, got involved and immediately pulled the plug, citing that the vehicles would be impractical to fit with the new proposed defence cuts and that no further work be carried on, although certain features should be passed to the FVRDE for future reference. Meanwhile, the Army would just have to make do with helicopters, if they wanted something that can cross obstacles and be used for reconnaissance, light weapons carrier and have liaison duties, and that strapping 12 air jet engines to a truck was probably not the best way forwards. To be fair to BAC, it was recorded that apart from the expense issue, the work they had done from a technical standpoint was considered very good, and mechanically no major fault had been found. If they had fully built it, all research indicated it would have at least worked. So let's take a look at the vehicle that would be done from the BAC brochure from the P-35 Dynamic Leap High Performance Fighting Vehicle. They state the P-35 met all the criteria. It was a lightly armoured chassis, able to stop small arms fire, and could use an air cushion to travel over soft and boggy terrain. If it encountered an obstruction, it could jump over a 10 foot obstacle and fly for 30 foot with enough fuel for 50 such jumps on a normal payload. Furthermore, it could hover at 10 foot and, if equipped with vigilant anti-tank guided missiles, engage enemy armour at long range before ducking back behind cover to reload. Should it need to, it could actually jump up to 22 foot over most houses, although this depended on what payload it was carrying and how much fuel it had left. To do this, it had 12 large air jets and a series of flywheels. It would build up an air cushion charge and then thrust the vehicle into the air, where it could hover for a time or fly to its designation, 30 foot away, and then land with the cushioning done by a similar air pocket. If needed for pure ground rolls, it was able to hit 50 miles an hour, or 80 kilometers an hour, and it was not expected to hover and jump, it could double its payload to two tons, which is reasonable. Each P-35 could carry a selection of equipment from goods and supplies to mortars and missiles. BAC's brochure stated it offered better and safer handling than a helicopter, which was exposed more and far more vulnerable, and had more movement options than a truck or similar vehicle. However, in the eyes of the military, it cost more than both combined, and so offered no advantages. Now, you might think the story ends here, but there was one more vehicle that came about at the end of this project, from a different firm who had been involved. This came from David Budworth Limited for the Clodhopper. This was basically a bus with two large gas turbine jets and the ability to fly further. However, while the firm had experience in making turbines, it was felt that overall this was too complex a project and the Clodhopper battle bus was not accepted. Well guys, that's the end of this one. I hope you liked this video. These were certainly interesting vehicles and nothing else. If you did like this video, give it a like, a share or subscribe and we'll be back soon with more weird and wonderful stuff. So until next time, toodle pip.